welcome to another week of Antidotes. I am Christine. I'm so happy to have everyone back this week. This is a very different episode than what we have been doing before. Every week, I talk to different medical providers about their stories. And before I record, before we go through everything and we get to their stories, I always say to them, be respectful of your stories. You know, make sure you're telling the story as if the patient is listening. We always say this whenever we talk about clinical cases and we're doing grand rounds or anything. And most of the time, we never expect the patient to listen. So it was a very interesting and shocking thing when I found out that someone who, and I hate to keep saying this, but we call the patient, uh, actually listened to one of our stories. So today, I'm actually going to get the other side of one of our episodes. So for those of you that listened to the Do What You Can episode with Pete, our Army medic, this is one of his patients, Tech Sergeant Dan Fai, who I will now stop referring to as the casualty because that's so disrespectful to call you that to your face. But welcome, Dan. Thank you so much for coming on and talking to me about this. No, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be able to do this. So you listened to the podcast episode, and that was actually the first time you've ever listened to a podcast. Oh, it is, yeah. I was able to, I've heard most of it. It was, it was actually really, really interesting. It was pretty cool to hear all the, all the stuff Pete had to say. Is it weird to listen to somebody talk about your medical care like that? Uh, no, not really. I'm, I'm kind of used to it by now. <laughs> it was a, I've, I've dealt with a lot of medical stuff since my injury. So, um, and I've had to talk about my injury so much that it's, it just used to hearing people talk about it. So to kind of tell people, I guess we'll catch them up a little bit if anyone doesn't really remember, cause it was a really long episode that Pete was in. You were injured by an IED in Afghanistan in about 2011. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, May 27th, 2011. But you were an EOD, EOD guy in the Air Force, not the Army like Pete. Yeah, no, the Air Force. Yeah, we were, uh, we're attached to his unit. Most people will probably not know what EOD is. And I very casually explained that you were the bomb guys in the episode, but it's quite more than that. So what, for the layperson, what is EOD? Uh, EOD is Explosive Orange Disposal. To sum it up, it's basically the military bomb squad, but we do a whole lot. We do getting rid of enemy remnants of war, all their unexploded ordnance, all their stockpiles. As far as the bomb squad side of it, we take care of all the roadside bombs, any IEDs that the insurgents were making or the enemy. Um, that was our job to go take care of those and not only just get rid of them, but also to exploit them for any kind of forensic evidence we can get out of them. So we weren't just like, you know, blowing place monkeys or bit monkeys like we call them. We'd actually go there and try and try and preserve as much evidence as possible. And it wasn't just, we're not just trained in conventional type explosives. We're also in chemical, biological, nuclear, the whole range of any kind of explosive hazards. And uh, it's it's pretty pretty interesting and fun fun job to do. How far into your deployment were you at that time? Um, that deployment, uh, I believe it was about three and a half months into that deployment um, when I was injured. Was this your first deployment or subsequent one? It was my fourth deployment. It was my third combat tour. Oh, shit. So I did tw uh, two to Iraq before that. And then this was my first to Afghanistan. My first non-combat was to Saudi Arabia. When did you join the Air Force? Uh, I joined in 2002. I joined in uh, March 2002, pretty much because of 9-11 yeah. is why I came in. And so it took a little bit of time to, to actually get into the door. But yeah, I was back in early 2002. So how frequently were you deploying? Well, I, I had some issues when I first came in. I injured my back, so I was had back surgery, and I had to recover and go through like medical issues with that. Yeah. And so it took a few years, but then when I finally deployed, it was like I was gone, and then I'd be home for maybe a year or two, and then I'd be deployed again, and I'd come home for a year, then go again, and then be home for another year and go again. So it was it was pretty pretty frequent once it started happening. They were, we were doing six month rotations. Some were, I think, a 12-month rotation for certain EOD positions, but I was on the, the six-month rotations. And so you'd be home for, if you're lucky, a year, year or so, and then gone for six months. It's really crazy to think about that this generation of service members have done so many deployments. I mean, I, when I was in, you would meet guys that have done as many tours as you did, you know, five, six, seven tours, especially if their career is, it's kind of incredible. Oh. They're gone more than they're home. 
Yeah, when I when I first came in and I, I finished EOD school and I went to my first uh, duty assignment, that was back. In, that was I finally got there in two thousand three, and guys were fighting with each other for deployments. Yeah, sure. Like they were because no one had done anything like that. Right. And you know everyone wanted to get their deployment before the war was over. Yeah. Which is kind of ironic now because it's still going. Yeah. But everyone, I mean, they were. I mean, they were like back and forth with each other. Who's going to go on the rotation? And yeah, everyone thought it'd be like over. Yeah. And then it got to the point where like people didn't want to go anymore. <laughs> They're just tired of it. Cause I have friends that was like, they go for six months, gone for six months, home for six months. It was worse than a year. I mean, these guys are getting hit nonstop. Mm-hmm. I have friends that came in with me that are like they're at least their eighth deployment right now. And it's just crazy how uh, the tempo is and that it just burns guys out. And it burns out your family too. I don't know how marriages survive that many deployments. Uh, it's not easy. <laughs> I was actually married before I came in. <laughs> Yeah. My wife was actually pregnant at the time. And so when I came in, she was at the end of her pregnancy. And when I got to EOD school, the day I showed up to Florida is when my son was born. Uh, so I've dealt with the family with kids from the very beginning. And it's def- it's not easy on the family. No. And so you've done EOD the entire time? Yes. I, I went into the Air Force uh, with an EOD contract. So people in the civilian world and even in the military world don't generally think of the Air Force as being the guys on the ground. I mean, obviously, there's like JTACs that are helping call in airstrikes on the ground. But I mean, there's always the joke amongst the services that you guys are the chair force, but very clearly that that's not the case. How much of the Air Force are guys on the ground like you? Outside the wire, there's not very many. There's us. You have PJs, combat controllers you know, those kind of jobs. And then you have like security force that do like outside the perimeter security. Yeah. So they do get outside the wire, but it's, it's not a lot no. of guys that are actually outside in harm's way. It's, it's very few, but when we go out, like out of the four deployments I've had, I've only been deployed with the air force once and the rest have all been, you know, been attached to the army the whole time. Um, the last time was actually the army and the Canadians. And I know you have like TAC P and the JTAC guys are with the army all the time. So it's, um, when we, it's funny because we were Air Force and we do deploy, it's not with other airmen. We're with other services or other countries. And so that's why I think a lot of people don't realize that we're actually out there doing stuff because they don't really see it. Yeah. And just for, there's a very mostly civilian audience that listens to this. So the PJs are these super badass pararescue jumper medics that are, they're basically special forces medics that like flight medics that the Air Force has and they're really fantastic and they operate under a little bit different rules than army medics and army flight medics do. And then JTACs and TACP, they are guys on the ground and they kind of tell the airplanes where to call in airstrikes. And that's my very simple. I'm oh, sorry, combat controllers, TACP. Yeah. yeah. That's my very simplistic <laughs> explanation of these very <laughs> important jobs <laughs> for people that are listening. So this was, you said fourth deployment. Yes. fourth. What was going on that day? You know, Pete said that he was out with you guys and you were clearing a market and you had gotten intel that there was a lot of chatter. You were expecting to get kind of hit with something, but you guys just didn't know what. Yeah, um, it actually, the whole mission actually started a few days earlier. We had some UAV video of guys were in place in IEDs in that area. And because of rules of engagement, they had to watch them until they got approval to actually engage them. So they watched them in place at least five or six IEDs before they could actually drop a bomb on them. So I got the call that they knew that they were doing something in our AO. Area of operation. Yeah, area of operation. So I, I took that to our um, one of the, uh, the commanders for the platoon that we're with and told them, hey, we got this going on right now. And I uh, just want to let you guys know. I know you guys want to push out in this area. So I think we need to go out there and clear that. And so they got back to me and said, okay, yeah, we got a mission. We'll do it in a few days. But they want to kind of con- con- kind of combine it because the road out there hadn't been cleared, mm-hmm. and they wanted to do like, okay, well, maybe we can get away with sending you guys out there if we have you guys clear the road. And so that's how the whole mission started. The, the day that we went to go do the mission, I was actually out of Cop Mushan, which was like maybe a couple clicks away from Telecan, where Pete was out of. And for some reason, they're having their guys take me out there instead of my own guys at our, at our cop to take us out there. So I went back out of Telecan and went with them in the morning. And we stopped at that that schoolhouse checkpoint that Pete had talked about, mm-hmm. which they turned into like some kind of ANA stronghold where they could actually uh, control the road. Afghan National Army. Sorry, I keep interrupting you because I just want to explain <laughs> things to people that don't speak the lingo. No, it's okay. I, I forget that sometimes. <laughs> so we were going to go and clear the road all the way up to that one spot where we we're supposed to go, which would have been probably... I don't know, a mile or two up the road. 
But as we started doing it, I was realizing really quick that it wasn't going to work because the kind of manpower we had, the people that were helping us with this, it was just going way too slow. And it would have taken us hours just to get up there. So I called it and said, hey, we're just going to go off the road. We're going to hop some grape rows because you know, they have the grape fields out there. And they're like big, basically mud mounds that you kind of have to climb over where they grow the grapes off of. So we're just going to kind of go through that and just bound our way all the way up into the location. And while we were doing that, we actually had a car pull up and a kid ran out and was like, you know, you know, boom, boom, bomb, boom. And we're like, uh, yeah, no, we know there's stuff over there. It's like, no, no, boom, like, boom, you're going to die, you know? Mm-hmm. And we were like, um, okay, well, we knew, it. We, we already knew there's stuff there. But then right after the kids showed up, that's when, like Pete said in the last one, we got um, radio chatter that they knew we were coming and they're going to try and ambush us. And I guess Pete's guys had been ambushed the day before in that area or had some kind of some kind of contact with the enemy so they thought something really was going to happen and uh so we stayed on a little bit higher alert and then we talked to some locals out there and they kind of warned us again so we're getting like all these like little signs along the way like this is going to be possibly a bad day but in my mind i'm like i'm excited because this is actually some work you know we're going to get to actually do something it it was going to be an exciting day and so we finally got to the location we're at and um i cleared out an area made it kind of like our safe working area. And then I pushed up to where we could stage all the army guys at that were there for us. And then we pushed up and I found a, a little weapons cache of like pressure plates and some little anti-personal landmines and some other kind of things on this little footbridge in an area that we'd been before. And so I set up the army guys to give a perimeter and I went with my, with my two other guys because EOD, especially Air Force, we run in three-man teams and I was a team leader at the time. So we pushed forward and set up our little working area and I went through with my metal detector to try and clear the area out. I was kind of like doing a like isolation area, make sure there was no like landmines or not landmines, but a command wire or anything like that or anything I could easily see. That's when we had a scooter come flying up on us and it was on the other side of like, there's a mound and like there's big weeds and stuff. So I couldn't see over what was going on, but it's like right on the other side of that mound for me. Then I started hearing the guy was yelling, and the army guys are yelling back and forth with this guy. And I'm like, okay, I guess this is probably it. I mean, this is what was coming on the, right. the radio. We're about to get attacked. And so I started sweeping again, trying to get a better view. And I'm using my metal detector, trying to sweep to see if I get anything. And then next thing I know, I'm in a, I'm in a dust cloud. And my ears are ringing like crazy. And I don't even know what's going on. Like, I think someone else got hit. And I forgot. I'm like alone down there. And I'm like, oh, man, someone got hit. So I'm like looking around trying to see. And uh, I move my arms, I kind of swing my right arm and I notice it smacks the ground. And then that's when it dawned on me, like, wait, I just got hit, but I can't see anything because I'm in a dust cloud and my ears are ringing so loud. I can't hear anything. Yeah. Then it kind of clears up a little bit and I kind of see where I'm sitting. And so that, that's pretty much what led up to that point where I got injured and uh, the, kind of the story behind it. So before we kind of talk about the injury, you had done these kind of sweeps, I'm imagining dozens and dozens of times before because you had done a bunch of deployments. And my my deployments were actually a little different. So when we got to my first one in Iraq, that was in Kirkuk. And uh, I was actually a team member, the uh, lower man on the team on that one. And we really had nothing. It was at the end of the fighting season. All the, the insurgents had ran through all their explosives and stuff. So the stuff that we did get, almost everything we did get was hoax devices. Mm-hmm. And I think we got like maybe two actual IEDs out of it. And then I was also doing it from a team member perspective. In Iraq, almost everything's ran mounted, which means we run out of our vehicles. So you're using bomb suits, you're using robots, completely different kind of situation. Talil, that was my second point, was to Talil, Iraq. There wasn't a whole lot going on there either. So my two combat tours didn't have a whole lot going on as far as doing the work. And then come Afghanistan, they sent us to Bravo flight in Kandahar, which is for the Air Force, one of the most dangerous flights to be in. And so I'm made team leader and we get there. And for the first part, I was working out of the main base. So we didn't get a whole lot. I got some really great stuff, like a lot of uh, demolition stuff. I got to do render safe procedures on unexploded rockets and landmines on the base, which was actually really amazing to do. And then as far as the IEDs were concerned, every time I get called on something, it was nothing. So they used to make fun of me because Every time I went anywhere, it used to be the safest place in the country because <laughs> nothing ever happened. I mean, I even after my injury, I, I'd never been shot at too, never gotten an engagement with the enemy, none of that stuff. So you're a white cloud. Yeah. So when we finally did get until so when we finally did <laughs> we did finally get stuff. It was one I got moved out to um, Kotmushan out on the 
at the time was the furthest out on the tip of the Horn of Panjoy. So it was like right there in the like the really bad area. And so I was excited because we're going to start getting some work. And we did. We picked up, I think, I, had a, I can't remember the exact number now. I think it was only like eight or 10 IEDs total. But I was only at Mushan for about a month, month and a half before I got injured. And uh, things were starting to really pick up by the time I, I actually stepped on the IED and got hurt. I think it's kind of a weird mentality to to explain to people that haven't worked in kind of a field that is dangerous, but you're also a little bit of adrenaline junkie to like want to to do that stuff, to like be excited when you're like, oh man, like this could get dangerous, but like I really want to do it. Like in EMS, when we got these calls that were like really horrific, oh, we're going to go to a shooting or a stabbing or something. You're like, yeah, like, yeah, let's do it. I'm all amped. And then, yeah, it's like really terrible. Someone's dying, but you're you want to do your job. Exactly. I imagine that's kind of the similar feeling you had when you're like, all right, cool. We could finally like clear some bombs and do some stuff after having not done it for multiple deployments. Well, you spend so much time training yeah. and making it your job and it's your life. And then for me, I went through you know two deployments. My full first point was like, there's no chance of anything happening in Saudi Arabia. And then uh, the last two, just nothing really happening. And you're kind of getting, I don't know, it, it kind of sucks because you're not doing the job that you want to do. Right. And then when you finally get a chance to do it, like the, the biggest mission I had in my whole career was probably a couple of weeks before I got injured, it was with the Canadians in the exact same place I got injured at. And we ended up having, I think it was like six to eight IEDs and a, and a post blast. One of their vehicles had hit a, an IED. And so I had to go make that area safe and you know do an investigation on stuff to find out what they hit. And I remember working on the IED and looking at the stuff and like I have like this 80 pound IED right underneath me as I'm like, setting up the cut wires and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I got this big smile on my face. <laughs> like I'm finally doing my work. And it was, it was a, it was a pretty amazing feeling. Cause you're like sitting there, like, I shouldn't be so excited about this, but I, I'm, I just got this huge smile on my face. Like I'm doing my work and uh, yeah, it was actually a really good feeling. And that was, that was the best mission I had pretty much my entire career, you know, cause at the end of it, like I was just spent, like we, we worked hard, like all day on this, this mission. And I was done. And the Canadians like, hey, you guys want to ride? And so we got to hop on top of their tank and ride their tank out. And it was a pretty amazing experience, especially in the Air Force, to yeah. be out in the middle of a combat zone with a bunch of Canadians riding on their tank, you know, through a bombed out area. It was, it was pretty awesome. That's some like G.I. Joe shit that you like want to do when you <laughs> enlist, right? That's what the recruiters tell you you're going to do, but you end up cleaning toilets instead. <laughs> Yeah, and it was it was crazy because that that area that um that I got injured in like because Pete calls it a market and it's called the Taliban Bazaar. It used to be a market, but it's where the Taliban would have their meetings. And they knew it, so they completely destroyed it. So it was just rubble. I mean, there was nothing left there. And um, prior to me getting injured, they had a uh, the ODA guys, the Special Forces guys. Mm -hmm. That when when they're NC, I think they're NCIC or whatever. Um, he he stepped on him. Yeah, he stepped in the IED and it killed him instantly, and it killed their interpreter. Oh God like maybe a hundred yards away from where I got injured. Mm -hmm. And so they called an airstrike and just pretty much leveled that whole place. They just got tired of dealing with the stuff that was going on there. But the problem is they'd already in place a ton of IEDs in the area that we knew of and they were still doing it. So it was extremely dangerous. But yeah, the market really wasn't the market it used to be. But yeah, that's the reason why I call it the Taliban Bazaar. At least that's the way it was explained to me from the guys that we were there with is that was where the Taliban would have their meetings. So going kind of back to your injury... So you come to a realization on the ground. What what does it feel like when you get injured? What are you thinking? My first thought was like, it, it kind of popped in my head of like, okay, well, what happened? You know, why this happened? What did I possibly step on? And so I'm in my head trying to think of these things. And then I went back to think of what was in that little weapons cache. Because that weapons cache was maybe 10, 15 yards away from where I got hit. So I'm thinking, okay, I saw what kind of landmines are there. I, I saw other things. Okay, I'm putting together what, what's in my head. So I know my teammate, I'm calling to him like, hey, I got hit. I think this is what I stepped on. Watch out for this. It's not clear yet. So in my head, I'm trying to think of like the safety of the scene, I guess. Yeah. Because instantly, like I, I, I knew something wasn't going to be right with me when I actually could finally start seeing stuff. And I looked down, I didn't know, I couldn't tell how bad my my injuries were because my left leg, which is missing below the like mid shin, was actually tucked under my right leg, and my right leg, which was like destroyed, like a shotgun blasted it. My head tells me, from what I remember, if the, my uniform was on top of it, my leg. So I'm looking down, and everything looked kind of okay, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this just this doesn't seem right because I'm actually in a crater and I know I stepped on it. So something's not right here. Yeah, I'm not going to look anymore. I am i don't want to go into shock. That was my first thing too. I don't want to go into shock. I'm not going to look at my injuries and see how bad it is. That'll make me go into shock. So I'm going to focus on all the other stuff I need to focus on. And I, I 
it's weird. I should have thought about start putting on tourniquets, but I didn't see like my injuries, which was kind of weird. So I didn't know I should be putting on tourniquets. So I just sat there and focused on trying to let my guys know, like tell them the situation and, and get them to me as safely as possible. How much training had you had with tourniquets beforehand? I mean, I know in the army, they drill us, they make us go through combat lifesaver, which is the like advanced first aid stuff. And then obviously I went through medic school, but they drill us on high and tight with those cat tourniquets. What did they teach you for medical stuff? That was the same way. I did a combat lifesaver three times for each combat tour that um, we have to go to combat lifesaver. Uh-huh. I know the, at least the first two, they taught us how to do IVs and nasal pharyngeals and needle chest decompressions and then doing tourniquets, how to stop bleeding, use quick clot. Yeah. I think the last time, I, if I remember correctly, I know they stopped doing it. I can't remember the last time they stopped doing it for us, but they don't teach us the the IVs or anything like that anymore. But they still yeah, do teach, okay. get the tourniquets high up into like the groin area and, and try and get as tight as possible. They get it high as high up on the limb as possible is what we were taught to do. And how many tourniquets did you have on you? There's the IFAC, which is the, the first aid kit you have. And they, those, I think they have one. Did you carry extra? We carried t- at least two on us. So I I can't remember which set, how we had it, but we'd carry, because we had like these little bottom pockets on our legs. Mm-hmm. So we'd carry, like say for instance, we'd have it in the left left leg, which is close to the ankle. You carry one there and then say your top right, we had a little pockets on our shoulders. Mm-hmm. So you'd carry like another one in your shoulder. So you'd have like the top right shoulder would be the one tourniquet, the bottom left ankle would be another, just in case if you did lose a leg or an arm, you can hopefully the other side will have a tourniquet on with you. And then you might strap some to your, your vest as well. And I can't remember. I know I at least carried two that day. So after you got injured, you're just thinking about everybody else around you. Did you have kind of an idea of how many people were around you? At first, the only one I really thought of is Staff Sergeant Dove. He was our number, my number two. I knew he was doing my safety backup. I knew he was going to be the first one to come to me. So that's the only one I thought of at the time. And I talked directly to him. And then the next thing I know, because he came up and he started trying to do the tourniquets on me. Because I remember him looking down and then he, I guess he could probably tell what my injuries were right away. Yeah. Um, and he tried to pull my leg out of the way. And then I think that's when he realized that it really wasn't connected well anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then, so then he started doing the tourniquets and then the, it kind of is a blur at that point. Like I still remember it all, but it's kind of a blur on how things happen. Yeah. Um, but then next thing I know, like, I guess it must've been Pete and a few other guys that showed up on me. And then that's when they started really starting to do medical stuff, trying to stabilize me. Do you have any sense of like how long it took from like when the blast happened to how long Pete got to you? No, not really. Like I said, the only one I remember first getting me was Dove. And then I don't know how long it took for Pete to get, I, don't, I probably wasn't very long at all. Yeah. From where they're at, I mean, it wasn't very far, but they kind of have to go around and then through a ravine to get to me yeah. to kind of take the same route I took because that's the safest route because I'd already been through that. But I don't, I, I can imagine it being more than a few minutes. Were you in any pain? Did you start to realize like, oh, there's injuries here? No, that was the weird thing is I don't really remember a lot of pain. I just remember. And this must have been after when Pete got to me, because it's funny. The one of the first thing, uh, thoughts I had, though, was um, I knew Dove was putting on tourniquets on me. But I remember them always saying that it's going to hurt like hell when they put a tourniquet on, but it's right. going to save your life. And in my head, I even thought, I'm like, this doesn't hurt at all. I don't feel anything from them putting on tourniquets. Yeah. And I guess Pete did say later the tourniquets weren't on tight enough. But even then, like, I don't remember, even when Pete came over, I don't remember him redoing tourniquets and any pain from that. Um, what I do remember, and I think now, like looking back after hearing Pete talk about it, I remember a lot of pressure, like feeling a lot of intense pressure. And that must have been him digging in my, my stuff, trying to stop the bleeding with the artery. But I don't, yeah, I didn't have a lot of pain. It was just a lot of pressure and then uh, an intense thirst, like the worst thirst you could ever imagine. That's what I had. And it was horrible. That was the worst, the worst thing of the whole thing was the, the unquenchable thirst. Cause I know shock victims, you're not supposed to give them water. Mm-hmm. They gave me a lot. I drank a lot of water. <laughs> they gave me, um, I think I cleared out their water. That's how much. And just, it was unquenchable. There's absolutely nothing you could do to make it better. That was probably the worst part of the experience was that. That's interesting. I'm wondering if it was maybe from the blast, maybe from the morphine or just the shunting and the fluid loss that you had that would cause that thirst. Cause we don't ever think about thirst with trauma victims like that. Yeah, I've uh, I, I've heard it has a lot to do with maybe the blood loss I had. Yeah. Because I believe I lost a lot of blood. And the funny thing is I really – going through the fire academy right now and I have friends that have been through EMT school, which I'm about to go through in February. I was talking to them and it never really dawned on me that I was actually dying at that time. That's a good thing. And so I was talking <laughs> – and it's funny though. Like I, I was literally talking to one of, the, one of the people in my group that's an EMT like 
two months ago and she, I was telling her my story and, and she's like, you realize you were in like in shock and you're dying. Right. And I'm like, I really never thought of it like that. Yeah. And I mean, so it's been since 2011, I didn't really think of how close I was to dying. It was just that, it was just a really very surreal experience. Yeah. It's not how you would have thought it was. It was like, not like the whole screaming and pain and stuff. I didn't start getting, um, and I don't know if I'm jumping the gun on this one, but I didn't start really thinking I was in trouble in that situation until I heard, apparently I found out later as Pete saying, I can't stop the bleeding. And then that's when I started getting mad. I wasn't in a lot of pain. Like I know I, I remember yelling, but it was more of like anger, especially with my job because our job is the IED. Right. And I just got hit by an IED when I was actually searching for one with the tools and everything. And to me, I was like, you know, they got me. Yeah. And I felt like I, you know, I lost. And so it just made me angry. But that was, that was it. I just, I don't remember a lot of pain. I don't remember that kind of stuff. I just remember the pressure and the, the thirst. So when you heard Pete say that he couldn't stop the bleeding, obviously you're probably angry just because you got blown up. But was there anger at Pete? I mean, even fleetingly in that moment, did you kind of react no. towards Pete? No. And it's funny, like, I, I really don't know Pete. Like, I met Pete <laughs> when he was working on me. Yeah. And then I, hadn't, I didn't hear back from Pete until later on my buddy Brian did his book. And then that's when we got connected again. There was nothing. He was trying his best. I knew that. I mean, there were, there was a, yeah, at yeah. the time when it started to kind of get together, that it started to be a group around me. And I don't know how long it took for that to happen, but I knew they were doing everything they could to uh, to get me as stable as possible. And uh, all I was hoping for is he could get me stable because, you know, in our head, we've always been ingrained with that golden hour thing. Right. And so I knew it was, it was taking a long time. And so... I was worried about it. Like we're going to go past that hour because we still had to get me back to Kandahar. Mm -hmm. And so when I heard Pete saying that I can't stop the bleeding and I'm still not hearing a bird, that's when it started like, okay, this is not going great right now. So, but yeah, no, there's no, yeah, no blaming of Pete or anything on that. I didn't think you, you meant that now, just kind of in that, that heated moment. It's so strange. It's such a weird thing that having worked a lot of traumas myself to have a conversation with your casualty later on. It's, there's this really, I was talking about this with my boyfriend uh, last week and trying to explain it to him because he's not a medical person. And I think you said you're going to the EMT class in February, which is so awesome that you don't realize it until you've, you've worked on someone that it is such a, an intense thing to be in a stranger's life in kind of a very significant moment of their life where it, maybe it's their last moment and sometimes it is and you're giving everything you have and you know them so intimately but they really don't know who you are and I mean you yeah. found out who Pete was but usually people don't know you and there's this weird anonymity that you have even though you're so deeply involved in their life it's it's very strange to then have that broken to talk with them yeah and what's weird too is like even if like I don't know. I, I couldn't even see anyone's faces during the whole thing. It's kind of, it's kind of weird. Like almost other than the one person I did know, my teammates, I didn't really know the other guys. So it's all kind of like a faceless group of people around you. So you don't even really have like a connection with any of these guys. And I didn't even know who was the medic that was working on me because I had so many people trying to do stuff to help Pete out. I would have never even guessed who was the medic at that time. So it's yeah, it's a it's a weird situation to be in, especially as a patient. And in that kind of a environment, like in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> with everyone just all wearing uniforms around you, you know, so they all look the same anyway. Right. Yeah, it was, it was just a very weird experience. Kind of jumping ahead a bit. So like you're going to be going to EMT school and obviously you're going to learn a bunch of stuff. But do you think there's things from your injury that are going to impact the way that you are as an EMT? Like saying, hey, I'm the medic, oh, maybe a little bit more clearly. I mean, they teach you to do that anyways in EMT school, but being a bit more cognizant of certain things because you've had this experience? I don't think it'd be much different than if I hadn't experienced it just because it's kind of almost, like you said, it's kind of common sense. You kind of understand like the person is going to want to know what's going on and, and you know, introducing yourself so they know who you are working on them. Yeah. I just now know from the other side how much that stuff does help. So it might in a way help me connect a little bit more and be more understanding of the situation. So maybe it's yeah. not such a uh, patient caregiver gap right there. Like I can understand the patient a lot more now. Yeah. So I, I can put myself a lot easier into their shoes, maybe read them a little bit better to see what might help them feel more comfortable. I don't know if that, if that's going to work, I'll find out, but I could see where that would probably be a benefit. 
I want to talk more about, because you just graduated from the Fire Academy. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. And I do want to talk about that, but I kind of want to stay on this track because I, I definitely jump around. So you said you didn't have any pain and I know Pete was giving you quite a bit of morphine. He said at one point you kind of started to realize, okay, time is passing. What, what, what did that feel like to you? It's funny. I didn't even realize the morphine that he was giving me morphine. I didn't really start feeling the effects of it until right before they load me on the helicopter. The helicopter thing, because in, in my head, like I said, like once he started working on me, then I'm like, okay, I don't have to worry so much. They're already down here. And I could worry, think about the situation. And in my head, it was like the whole like, you know, golden hour thing, golden hour. Yeah. You, know, you got to get to, got to get to roll three, which is the medical facility at, at Kenhar. Mm-hmm. And the whole time I'm like, okay, where's the, where's the helicopter at? And in my head, I'm like, I'm, the whole time I'm like, okay, I need to get out of here, but I need a helicopter. And nothing is coming. And to me, like, I, I can't remember the exact time. I know um, when Brian did this stuff, he was actually able to find the exact, I, I can't remember if it was like 30 something minutes or 40 something minutes before the helicopter actually oh, got shit. there. But it feels like, it feels like forever. That, that's a long time. Yeah. And I can't remember the exact, Brian, Brian's got in his book, the exact time. And then I have a friend that actually did my post blast analysis. He's got the time in there too. It, it felt a lot longer than that though. It, it felt like it was forever. It was just dragging on and on. When I brought up the Pete, then I heard them say like they're trying to get the bird, but the bird wasn't coming. So finally, after that time, that's when the helicopter finally showed up. And I could, it was pretty crazy because I'm lay, like laying on the ground. It actually like showed up right in front of me. So I could see it. I could hear it coming like, and then see it land right in front of me and land in the area where I'd originally started clearing it, which is the most amazing sound in the world, by the way, when you start yeah. hearing the rotors as the birds coming to get you. Yeah. But uh, yeah, no, because the whole thing is that golden hour. And so that's what was making me think of that helicopter the whole time. Like it needs to be here. But I didn't know exactly how bad the communications had been at that point. And I didn't know that until I think even Pete said he didn't even know until later on when Brian was doing the book that there was all that miscommunication going on. When you got into the helicopter, these were not medical soldiers. This was not a medevac. This was a Kazavac, which is a Yes. So people that don't know, medevac is an evacuation by medical soldiers, medics, flight medics, nurses, et cetera. Kazavac is a non-medical vehicle moving a casualty. So it's different. They don't have any equipment on there other than their own personal first aid kits. What was it like to get on that helicopter? It it was pretty weird. At that point is when the morphine really started to kick in. So I was feeling pretty good, (laughs) or at least I was noticing it more. So I was like kind of just all kind of in a happy mood. I mean, even my buddy had made a joke to me at the time. So I'm actually laughing as they're putting me on the uh, the helicopter. And so they get me on and the two crew members on the helicopter, one I know is talking with Pete for a little bit. And then they came, you know, he got done with Pete, came to me and they kind of got me situated where I need to be. And I was like, hey guys, thanks for coming to get me. I appreciate it. And they didn't say one word to me. They didn't even look at me. And then they went, went off into other parts of the helicopter. And I'm like, this is the worst damn medevac ever. Like <laughs> the entire time I'm in the helicopter, not one person's even talking to me. They're not even near oh my me. God. And I'm like, this is really not right. I'm like, where the hell are my PJs yeah. at? You know, I'm Air Force. Where are my PJs yeah. at? And so I'm just sitting there laying there staring at the, the roof of the helicopter. Now my morphine haze. I know <laughs> what's going on and why no one's working on me. And so the whole time flying there, nothing. And then when we land at Kandahar, that's when – the medics. I finally got to see medics. I remember, I, I don't know if she was who she was. I don't know if she was a nurse or just someone like loading people on, but I remember hearing something along the lines of like, you know, you're, we got you now. You're going to be safe. You know, you're, you're going to be okay. I remember just hearing that and not know necessarily what she said, but the voice of it, just the comfort, finally having some medical attention. And I knew I was there and I knew I was going to be fine at that point. That's amazing. That's, we say these things to patients and we kind of think that they fall on deaf ears sometimes. We always want to provide comfort to people. We hope we do, but we never know that we do. So it's it's always really nice when you hear the patient side that you actually get that across, that you get that reassurance across. Well, there's also there's also flip side to that too. It's pretty fun. I don't know what guy it was. It was one of the army guys. <laughs> and I remember, and I don't know how much he'd said it, but in my head, it was like almost like we're on repeat. But he kept going like, and I think he was freaking out as much as, you know, anyone else would in the situation. This but, is in the helicopter or in the hospital? No, this, sorry. This is, let me go back. This is um, as they're working on oh, me okay. at the bomb site. And one of the army guys is right there. And he's like, the whole time he's like, oh, you know, you're doing great. You're, you're, you're making your family so proud. Your family's going to be so proud oh, of you. And, but he, but he kept saying it because I think he, 
And I don't know, he might've only said it once or twice, but in my head it kept going and it was so annoying. Like, it was like, dude, okay, I get it. I get it. And like, then I start focusing on that and I'm like, dude, just stop. Right, We're good. Stop. We're good. I didn't say anything. We didn't say anything. And I know like after the situation, I'm thinking back, I'm like, this dude had to been really nervous yeah. too, because they just got into country. And I didn't know at the time that I was the first patient Pete had ever worked yeah. on. So the guys that are around, they're all really young, inexperienced guys. And so they're probably all freaking out about the situation too. And uh, yeah, I, I, like it's, I can laugh about it. Now at the time I was like, just really annoying. So you have the, the difference, like, oh, you can comfort, but you can also annoy. Yeah. And, and, I, and it was all, all of it was done out of good intention. So all of these things are, I'm laughing so hard in my head because these are your new EMTs, your new nurses. And when you get on the truck, when you realize you've got these, these total green kids that like just ignore their patients because they don't know what to say because they're too nervous and that's your guys in the helicopter. And then there's the the nervous EMTs that are brand new and they just like to talk and they're really well-intentioned and they just keep talking. And I would have third riders or something. I'm like, okay, you need to, you need to chill out. Like they know they appreciate <laughs> this, but like they're going to punch you in the face because you gotta, you gotta knock it off. <laughs> yeah. And you can, you can, I guess you can probably read your patient to kind of tell where they're at. I mean, if you're talking to them and they're talking back to you, if they're not talking, they're probably not focusing on that as much. I, I, I did appreciate them trying to as much, <laughs> as much as he was. Um, Cause I don't even know how I would, I've never had to deal with an injured person before. All my times, I never had anyone injured. I've had friends, you know, injured and killed, but I was never with them when it happened. Yeah. So I didn't even know exactly how I would react in that situation. It's, uh, you know, most people never know what it's like to react in that situation. Yeah. Some people are nervous talkers. And sometimes it depends on the situation. You learn as you get more experience what you end up saying. And you're like, oh, I, I shouldn't say that or I should focus on something else. And you learn little tricks in your head like... You know, I've worked a lot of traumas and I found myself getting to that really nervous point and I could feel like myself shaking. I remember one time we were doing a traumatic arrest and I felt like a leg shaking as I'm like hooking up the oxygen and it was just, okay, big deep breaths and just count to 10 in your head. And what I would always do when I knew I was going into a big trauma is put on my gloves like really, really slowly as I'm counting to 10 because it was just my center yourself before you walk into this. You got to practice dealing with that because someone is dying in front of you and it, you don't know how you're going to react until you do it. And everyone's well-intentioned, but you got to, you got to practice, I guess. And the, Pete was the only medic there. So that guy that was reassuring you, he hasn't even been to a, a class other than CLS on how to do this. I think Pete said he trained someone a little bit more on CLS to help him. So it's, it's no wonder that, you know, he was a little bit annoying maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It was a, uh, yeah. I, and I knew like, I knew those guys cause, and then they just got in the country too. I mean, they think they're maybe there, what, a, maybe a couple weeks if that much, even as far as just being in the, the new AO, everything was, was new for a lot of these guys. So when you got to Kandahar, yes. what was it like in the hospital there? So it was from when they unloaded me and then the lady said her things and I just felt just more comfort and they're all around me and they're, they're taking me back. And at this point, I'm kind of now kind of really filling the morphine. And they, I, I, I could sense what they're doing. They roll me inside of a building. And I guess there must have been a doctor one of the nurses robes like, you know, hey, we got you here. We're gonna, um, you're going to be okay. I need to check for internal bleeding. Hold on. This is going to be uncomfortable. Oh, yeah. And he turns around and, you know, shoves, shoves up checking for internal bleeding. And uh, I remember being there enough to tell him, like, at least he could have bought me a drink <laughs> first. And then literally, that is the last thing I remember. Oh, like, no. Getting a finger shut finger shut off my butt saying that and then they must have gave me something and put me out. I was done. Oh gosh. Next memory I have is apparently like they're trying to give me an MRI or a CAT scan mm -hmm. because I, I started to wake up and they're as they're putting me into the machine. And one of the guys on my team would play the game Portal, Portal Two on I can't remember if I had Xbox or something. Mm -hmm. It's a game where they like shoot these portals and you go through these holes and you, you know, pop through another portal. So you're going through these portal holes. And for some reason, I thought that the machine was a portal and they're trying to shove me in a, a portal. And I was like, I'm not, no, I'm not going in the portal. Get me out of here. And I'm like freaking out because for some reason now I'm like so high on drugs and pain. Yeah. Now I'm thinking I'm like in a video game and they're like, oh no, start to fight. Calm down. You're going to be okay. And I'm like, no, I'm not going in the portal. And I'm like high as a kite apparently and hallucinating. And then yeah. I'm knocked out again. And then the next memory I have is I wake up after all the surgeries and uh, I look down and I see my 
my left leg is gone. I pretty much knew it when I left. Before I got on the helicopter, I knew the left leg below the knee was gone. I had no idea how bad my right, I didn't even know there's anything wrong with my right leg. And I look over my, my right foot is, you know, over 90 degrees to the right. And they got an external fixator attached to it. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking down, I'm like, that doesn't look right. But the first thought I had is like, I'm going home. I'm alive. You know, I get to go see my family. And that was honestly the first thought I had when I woke up is I looked down and I'm like, my legs are messed up and you know, but I'm alive and I'm going home with my family. And that's all I cared about. And then I think I passed out again. And then the next thing I know, uh, I came to, and then that's when they're like, try to get me to call back uh, to talk to my wife to let her know I'm still, still there. And how, how long after injury did you wake up and realize that you had the amputation? Like what, how much time had passed? I'm not I'm not really sure. I've not looked at the time on that. I don't even know if there's any way to find that out. I assume it's all the same day because um, I got injured in the morning. Mm-hmm. But when I finally called and talked to my wife, she'd already known. She'd already known for a, a little while that for hours, I think, that I'd been injured because she'd already been notified and the people already showed up at my house. So it had to have been a while. Yeah, it had to have been a good chunk of time. I just don't know for sure. But it wasn't like a couple of days. It was maybe like one day or so. Oh, it, it, I think it was all. This, it was the same day. Okay. How does your wife say that she reacted to that? For her, it was actually um, it was a really really rough experience. Oh, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Because the the day before I got injured, two of my good friends from our unit were killed. Oh gosh. They're out with the Pathfinders, so it was like one of the worst days in you know the Afghan War for for coalition forces because I think we lost a total of eight. U.S. service members in that one, and two of them were my my friends, and they're Air Force EAD techs. Tech Sergeant Soulsby and, and Staff Sergeant Hansky. So that had just happened, and we're not, you know, you're not allowed to call back and tell your family anything because you're on the calm blackouts. Right. But I knew that this was going to get out. That I mean, it was bad enough that the news was going to report something, and so I just said, "Hey, I just want to let you know I'm okay. Mm-hmm. You know, something happened, but I'm okay." And that's when I think, yeah, the time frame was. She was getting up for her day or about to go to bed. And then I was doing something. The way the time frames worked out, she found out that that before she went to bed. And so we went out and did our mission. And then she ended up seeing it on the news about something bad happened in Afghanistan. And then I went and did my mission, got hurt. So the next morning she gets woken up at like early in the morning from my supervisor. Because I was stationed at Joint Base Lewis McCord, uh, the McCord side. And my supervisor called her. He was like, hey, Nicole, I need you to come answer the door. And Nicole's like, uh, what's going on? She's like, um, it's about Danny. You know, we got to talk to you. And she's like, is he okay? And she kind of hesitated. And I guess she was asking who was with her if it was okay to say anything. And she's like, no, he's okay. He, he's alive. We just, we, we need to talk to you. It's about him. And so she went downstairs and that's when my supervisor, my commander, the chaplain, all were at the door. So she officially got the knock at the door, like uh, most people feared. Yeah. And so it was a really, really rough for her to, to deal with that. But the funny thing about it was, you know, they're in their GOVs and there's a couple of people in our, in our neighborhood that were in the military. And, uh, Nicole's like, oh man, people are going to, people are going to know something happened with, uh, you know, with Danny, with the car out here and like, oh, don't worry. We parked on the street and they parked in front of another, another service member's door. Oh God. <laughs> so, uh, so she thought that was pretty funny, oh, no. but yeah, so she, she got the whole, cause what happened was I notified her about my buddies, what happened with them. And then she went to bed. So when she woke up, she was like, I don't know what you guys were talking about. He told me everything was okay, right. but they didn't understand. And then that's where there was a lot of confusion too with other people. They thought it was the same same mission where my, my friends got killed because it was just so close in time. I mean, it was like they got injured in the very next morning I got injured. Yeah. So everyone thought it was the same mission. Technically, we weren't supposed to be out on that mission. They should have had a, a safety stand down and we should have been not doing anything during that time frame, until we figured out what was going on with theirs. Right. But, you know, stuff happens. How long were you in Kandahar for in the hospital before you got transferred out of country? I think it was probably a, a day, if that. Yeah. And then they got me on, they, then they flew me to Bagram. And then I went to Bagram and I was there for a little bit. I can't remember if they did it because I've had, I had surgeries along the way, mm-hmm. more stabilization stuff, more cleaning the wounds. Um, so I'm not 100% sure of like how many surgeries I had at each spot because. I went from Kanar to Bagram, from Bagram to Launchstuhl, I believe. Which is in Germany, the big hospital there. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was Launchstuhl. And I was there for, I think, a day. At this point, like they had me really sedated. In Germany, I only remember one, like being in a, a hallway on a gurney. And that's like the really only memory I had from there. And then loading me up on the C, um, C-17. C Yeah, next thing I know, I'm waking up at Walter Reed. Mm-hmm. 
and then from Walter Reed, yeah, they they flew me over to uh, Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas, and then that's where I ended up staying at Brook Army Medical Center. Well, that's what it was at the time to go through the, the limb salvage and the other surgeries to to really start working on me. How long did it take for you to get to Fort Sam to uh, Brook Army Medical Center? Oh man, I I don't I don't really remember that. I'd have to ask Nicole. I it really wasn't maybe a few days. Oh, that that's fast. I don't, I, I'd have to ask. It was pretty quick because even Nicole being told she's got to go to, to San Antonio, it happened really fast for her. So I'm thinking it was a few days. I don't think much more than that. Okay. But like I said, I can't remember exactly the time frame. I, I never really found out the time frame. I just, yeah, yeah I wasn't going to know what was going on. Yeah, you were busy, <laughs> understandably. Yeah, a little th- few things going on. Yeah. <laughs> How long did you end up staying at Fort Sam, or I keep saying Fort Sam, Brook Army Medical Center? How long were you there total? Initially, I was an inpatient for two and a half months. It was yeah, it was rough. Um, it took a long time because of my limb salvage and the pain. Mm-hmm. They couldn't control my pain, so they had to keep me there and all the stuff they were doing trying to save my right leg. So I was there for two and a half months, and then I got released from the hospital, but they forgot to give me all my narcotics. Uh. And so I started to go through withdrawals, and we had to call an ambulance and send me back, and I was back in the hospital for another I think, week or two. And then there was a few other little surgeries and other things that kind of came along the way. So I had over three months total inpatient, but the initial was two and a half months. What were they using to control your pain, if you don't mind me asking? Well, for the pain, they were uh, everything you can imagine, honestly. I was on Oxy, I was on Dilaudid, I was on Percocet, I was on Methadone, I was on, I'll say Dilaudid. Probably fentanyl. Fentanyl. I was on fentanyl, which is one of the ones they forgot to give me when they released me from the hospital. Yeah. I got pictures of me with the fentanyl pops and they gave me the, the max dose fentanyl pops they had. Yeah. And I was like, just eating those like candy. Uh, but they're also like combining all this stuff at the same time. Right. So I'm taking multiple things at one time. They tried to do nerve blocks. They tried to do epidurals. What else? It ended up being the pain got so bad that they had to put me on a ketamine drip. Yeah. So I was on that for a while. Um, and they made my wife sign like a waiver because they said I could go into a coma on that one. So she was really apprehensive about having me do that. So yeah, anything you can think of, they they had me on. I mean, they at one point that that's why they put me on the ketamine drip because they said we've given them the max out on everything and anything we can give them, and it's doing absolutely nothing. Did the ketamine? The pain was horrible. The ketamine did nothing except for put me in a. I think it was about a week I was in there. I just just being in the haze the whole time. That's all I remember, just being in, like literally a haze because everything looked all kind of foggy. Yeah. And I don't even know if it even helped with the pain. I just remember just being zoned out. And then afterwards, because they're doing it to try and reboot my system so they make the pain meds work again. Right. And it did nothing. That frame that I had to wear, I wore the Taylor Spatial frame on my right leg because I'd lost so much bone out of my leg that we had to grow like three or four inches of it back, I think it was. It was uh, in it, it, the pain was just, it's really hard to describe how bad, bad it was. The best way that I remember at the time I told Nicole, like the way I could describe it is it felt like putting my like forging my leg, literally forging my leg, like shoving in a furnace and then hammering it. That's exactly what it felt like. And like, there's like, she does have some video of me like talking, but I'm like rocking back and forth trying to, to stem the pain. Yeah, but nothing, not even epidurals, nerve blocks did nothing. Now the pain is, was it from nerve damage or regrowing the bone in that limb in the right leg? I think it was from everything, which is so weird because I had no pain prior to it. Right. It must have been because of the adrenaline and everything going. I just didn't feel anything. And then when the, the Taylor spatial frame, it's it also keeps your leg under tension because they need that tension to help the bone grow. Yeah. So I think that the frame alone had a lot because the frames have all the pins and bolts and stuff. And I had like five rings in my foot plate and the foot plate had all the pins going through my toes and everything. And the funny thing is they told me like, hey, you know, the good news is there's no damage to your ankle. It's just in your leg. Well, because I was in the frame so long, my ankle is destroyed now. It's like useless. Oh God! It's actually kind of locked, almost self-fused. So I'm not, I'm not 100 percent sure what was causing all the pain, but I just know like I've never felt anything like it before, and I hope I never do again because it was excruciating pain for the first probably four months, and then after that it was just really bad pain, like bad, bad pain. <laughs> like normal people would probably call it excruciating what my normal was, but yeah, it, but nothing ever helped it. You know, they just released this new medication. The FDA just approved this new opioid, and it's for really severe pain that can't be controlled with Dilaudid and fentanyl and everything like that. And it's so controversial because people are like, we have this horrible opioid addiction problem. But if you're you, if you're going through something like that, you need something stronger. So in very significant injuries and special cases, we need stronger pain medications for certain people. It's it's a scary situation just because 
when it comes to the, my, my dad and my father-in-law both struggled with uh, addiction to prescription drugs. So when I was going through the hospital, like I, I wanted nothing to do with it, even though I knew I needed it yeah. and I was on everything imaginable. I didn't want it. I remember um, they kept saying, you know, we can't stop your pain. We're going to try methadone. I remember when they told me that methadone, for some reason, of all the stuff they gave me, that was the one I just didn't want. Yeah. And I was like, I'm not, I'm, no, no more. I don't want any more. Nothing's working. I don't want any more. And they kept forcing more stuff on. So they're giving me more stuff that I didn't even want. I kept telling them I didn't want. They kept giving me more and more. And it just kept making me mad because I'm getting more and more into the stuff and none of it's working. And I, and I understand the need for for the pain medicine the, the funny thing about it too is like as they're giving me the meds i'm like you know hey how about you guys give me some uh some medical marijuana and they're like oh you know sergeant fly i'm i'm sorry about that but uh your your active duty we can't give that to you oh and that's like, bullshit just, it makes me so fucking mad uh. i thought i thought it was the funniest thing in the world i was like yeah you guys are literally giving me like heroin and i can't have that i thought it was just pretty funny yeah it does but then it goes on the other side of like you know you know no, you need the narcotics i know other i know guys that have been hooked on narcotics because of having to take it because of stuff. And it's, it's one of those really slippery slopes. And yeah. I don't know if it just depends on the person or what, but I've seen guys with less injuries than me hooked on stuff because of just the little injury they had. Oh yeah. So, and then I'm here like just stuffed with the max amount you can give someone. And I was able to get off with relatively no problem other than the withdrawal issues, having to work through the withdrawal stuff, making sure you did it safely. That was the only reason why it took me so long to get off it because my levels were so high. And I, and I did experience withdrawal when they forgot to give me my narcotics, one of which was the fentanyl. It was so bad. I thought I was going to die. Like I was literally at the time I had hair, I'm trying to rip my hair out yeah. and you know, I'm in the ER throwing stuff around. I can't control myself. And it was, it was scary. So I understand being on narcotics. I understand like the fear of going through withdrawals because it is absolutely terrifying. It was like almost as close to film like I was going to die as it was actually going to blown up. So it's a, yeah, I'm the narcotic stuff is a, it's a scary thing to deal with. There's a huge issue with opioid addiction in service members, especially after they've been injured because certain people are just more predisposed to getting addicted to anything. But then also there's a big issue with TBI and association with opioid addiction. I used to work in opioid addiction as a nurse practitioner. And it's it's terrible that you get injured and then you get prescribed narcotics very legitimately. And then now you can't stop because that's just how these meds work. And uh, it's a slippery slope. So how did you how did you get off of it? How did your pain stop? When, when did that change? I still had the pain. Like I said, it really wasn't doing much. So I myself decided to get off the stuff and I started weaning myself off. A lot of the doctors were like, no, you don't need, you, you have too much pain. You know, you don't want to get off that stuff. But the whole time, like, I just want to get off these meds because it's not helping and it's making me really sick. Yeah. Like I was, it would be so bad, especially right after I got out of the hospital, my wife, Nicole, she would take me and so I'd have to be in a wheelchair and she rolled me out to the car and I'm like throwing up as I'm being rolled out to my car in the parking lot and we get in the car and we drive on the freeway there and I'd have to have her pull over on the freeway so I could throw up. And then I'd get there and like, as I got to the base, I'd throw up again. I'd be like, you know, just turn around, go home. There's, how am I supposed to do therapy when I'm like this? Right. At that point I knew I just had to get off it because it's making me so sick. And so I just weaned myself off, just slowly got myself off all the stuff. I took a while. I think it was uh, the first year I was on stuff. After that, I really started kind of weaning off. I don't know exactly the time frame, but I weaned myself off and, uh, I, I really don't take any pain meds at all. For my pain, I just take Motrin. I just I just have a real dislike for any kind of narcotic as far as that's concerned. So I try and stay as far away from it as I can. Do you still have pain now? I imagine you would still have pain, but how significant is the pain and what is the thing that's painful now? I, I do. Like I have a, I have a neuroma on the bottom of my, my residual limb mm-hmm. on the right side. And so that can be a pain. It really can start flaring up and give me a lot of zingers, they'd call it, just zapping me with the, the nerve or just like really tight pain, like it'll cause the muscle contract. My right side is the one where I get the limb cellar side is the most painful by far. Yeah. Like right now we were supposed to, for the fire academy, it's like our last day of doing like anything on the fire grounds. And, you know, we had a, you know, our last PT day and I don't run. That's my thing. I don't run because I just can't really do it right now, but I can do everything else. And so the last day they wants to go run like three miles. And I was like, you know, what? I'm going to go with my, my team and I'm, I'll, I'll go run with them see what I can do. And I didn't have my running leg because I do have a running leg to try and make it a little bit easier. Yeah. It, it turned it from a jog into kind of a walk shuffle for most of it. But like this morning I woke up my ankle, it feels like someone's like hammering a nail through it. Like if I, if I walk on it wrong, it's just like a, such a 
horrible pain in the ankle, like feel like it's going to collapse. And then you get a lot of nerve pain from all the damage to the leg. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So most days I don't really have a lot of pain and, and I can just deal with it. It's And if I do have something that's whatever, it's kind of like in the back of my head and it really doesn't bother me. Mm -hmm. And then you have some stuff like this where it gets flared up and it, it hurts really bad. And I might go take a Motrin, but that's about it. That's It's pretty impressive that Motrin can control it after everything. I don't think it does. I think it's like me at least saying I'm trying something to make the pain go away. <laughs> like I don't I don't take gabapentin and neurotin anymore. Yeah. I don't do any of that stuff. I have other meds like I have to be on for like high blood pressure and, and thyroid. And I hate being on that. If I don't have to be on something, I don't want to be on it. And if it's a pain thing, I can if I can deal with it, I'll deal with it. How long did they have you in physical therapy? Do you still do physical therapy? No, um, I was in physical therapy for at least two years. Mm -hmm. First year was kind of, it's kind of pointless because I was in that frame and I couldn't really walk. I could put no real weight on it. Mm -hmm. uh, at about 10 months is when they took the foot plate portion off. And then I was actually able to kind of walk a little bit better. But I'm, at that point, I'm walking with like canes and, and crutches. And then when the rest of the stuff came off, that's when I was able to start really walking. And that I, I was able to get casted for a, uh, it's called, well, they called my Deo brace in the military and then in the civilian life it's called the exosin brace through hanger. And with this, I'm actually able to do stuff. Second I got this one, I was able to just get rid of the, the canes and crutches and walk and do whatever I need with no problems. It's funny, like I was in the powerlifting for a while. I still lift in the gym. I've done like a mud runner, I like the hike. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm doing the fire academy. Yeah. And and all this stuff. If I don't have my brace, I can't even walk. So I could I can walk for a little bit. Like I'll walk from my bed to the bathroom or kind of you know, hobble around, but without it, I would literally be in a wheelchair or a double amputee right now. So it's it's kind of crazy the stuff I am doing all because of this one device, which is amazing. It's like an artificial leg because it really makes up for what I can't do with my leg. So having been through all of this and so many years later now, I mean, I'm sure it doesn't seem like it's that far away, but what would you tell someone that kind of just got injured? Is there anything like any advice you would give to them? Like, hey, watch out for this or tips or anything? One of them is like, it's always good to stay positive, but don't shoot too high on what you're going to be able to do right away. Be optimistic, but don't be unrealistic. Mm -hmm. I guess you can and put like that. Because like one of the situations I had with me was they kept telling me like, hey, you're, you're going to go to Germany. We're going to send you to Germany to go meet your guys so they come back in. And I'm like, all right, you know, I'm going to go see my guys come back in. Yeah. Um, we're going to spend some time in Germany. I was still in the hospital for like another month like after yeah. my guys got back from Afghanistan. I thought I was going to be up and running or at least walking. And I really didn't walk for almost a year. But people were telling me those kind of things. Like, you're going to, oh, yeah, you're going to do this and that. So I thought in a year, I'm honestly... Also, God, I thought I was going to be running, and I was not even walking really at that point. So if people have been more honest, like, hey, this is it's going to be really a challenge. It's going to be really difficult what you're going to go through, but you can get through it. It's just going to take time, and it's going to suck. But if you stay with it, you're going to be okay. That's what I would tell them. I would tell them, like, you know, no matter how difficult it is, there's going to be an outcome. It's going to be different than where you're at right now. You don't know exactly what that outcome is going to be yet, but just get there. Take it step by step. Push forward. And, and take every milestone, like celebrate the hell out of it because those are big deals. Like for me, one of the biggest milestones I had, honestly, the first one I remember being super excited about was being able to stand up to pee. I was so tired of having to sit and pee in a bottle or lay in a bottle. I was so happy to be able to stand up to pee because at that point, it had probably been at least four or, four or five months. <laughs> that was a huge deal for yeah. me. So just take every little milestone like you can and just, just be realistic and don't get worried about the setbacks because there's always going to be setbacks, especially in an injury like that. You're going to have an infection or you're going to have, you know, something's not going to work right. But just, you know what, just deal with it and buckle down and push forward. You know, you might not get where you want to be, but it's going to be a lot further than you are at that point. Just, just stay, just stay positive. How did you handle the setbacks? Like emotionally, how did you stay kind of positive? I guess, I mean, I must... I'm going to assume you didn't, you weren't positive all the time, but how did you come back from those disappointments that you had? You know, I don't know. I know there was, there were a lot because like I said, I had these, these expectations and they weren't coming around right. and it was really hard on the family. So the family was struggling really bad with, with everything was going on. And I can honestly think like the first time when things started to really push forward for me, you know, cause I got my brace off or my frame off. Um, I got into the brace and at the time I was really like just out of shape. I was fat. I, I mean, I was just just not doing too good physically. And one of my buddies came up and was like, "Hey, Dan, you're a big guy. I want you to look into the, the gym, like look into powerlifting or something." Mm -hmm. I was like, "What do you? How am I going to do that? Look at my situation of it." And he's like, "No, seriously, go check this gym out. I went and checked out this awesome gym in San Antonio called the Olympic Gym. 
Um, one of my buddies there, Kedrick, he's uh, paralyzed and in a wheelchair, and he was a power lift, amazingly strong power lift. Like he, at the time, he was eventually like 500 pounds. And so I started seeing these other guys and pushing myself, and, and that's what it was. It was finally kind of getting away from feeling bad for yourself, kind of just letting the pain and, and the, the inability to do things dictate how you run your life and say, you know what, I'm going to do better. I'm going to push myself more. And then actually see like, you know, you might think like, oh man, I can't do this. I can't do it. But you don't know unless you do it. Right. So getting into the gym actually allowed me to get stronger. It allowed me to, which in turn really changed the way my body was working. Mm -hmm. It helped me be able to do more, not just in the gym, but actually do more and, and enjoy life more. And then I got to see like, hey, I can actually do this power and stuff. I was actually enjoying like lifting heavy weights and it gave me a new, new outlook that, hey, you know, I, I can start doing more and more. And, and even then, like when I was in the gym, I was like, even certain things like, oh, I can't deadlift. There's no way I'm going to be able to deadlift. And my buddy would tell me to give it a shot. And I'm like, okay. Next thing I know, I'm deadlifting, you know, over 500 pounds and doing competitions for that. And then like, oh, I can't do squats because I don't have ankles. And I <laughs> had people help me out and show me how to do squats and I can do squats. They're not great, but I can, I can do squats. And I can even, if I do it right, a, a good competition squat, not great, but I can get it. So you just have to realize that you just don't know if you can do something unless you try it. Right. I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't always positive. You can tell, like, there's a lot of things I did a lot of, like, a lot of self-doubt. Sure. But then I'd push it. And then then at the point where I came to the Fire Academy stuff later on in life, it wasn't like, a, oh, I can't do that. It's like, well, maybe I can. Let's see if I can. That's what it becomes. It comes once you start pushing yourself a little more, it always no longer like, oh, I can't do this. It's like, well, maybe I can. Let's see how I can do it. And you might not necessarily be able to do it the way everyone else does, but you can find a way how you can do it and still be able to get the mission done, you know, still do this, you know, the same outcome as someone else. It's just going to be the way that you have to get it done. So what made you want to go into the fire academy? What was so interesting about fire and EMS and everything? I mean, obviously things exploding and being on fire seems pretty related, but <laughs> was there anything else that kind of spoke to you about it? Fire was actually, was actually my dream as a kid. Oh yeah. That was my whole plan growing up. I want to be a firefighter. EMS was never, it still is not like really my my thing that it, that draws me to the the career field, it kind of comes along with it now and it interests me, but it's- Yeah, you kind of have to be. I want to be a firefighter. That was it. I remember it, uh, as a kid, Backdraft came out. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> What's funny now is that actually I just watched it again after going through the fire academy, you realize just what a horrible movie it is. It really is. And that's so unrealistic, <laughs> but it's still so awesome. You know, it's like, as a kid, like this is it. So that's what I want to be. There's some things that kind of got in the way of that happening. I let it kind of discourage me and- started doing a few other little jobs. And then when 9-11 happened is when I went to go join the military. I was like, you know what? I want to be a firefighter. I'm going to be a firefighter in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. That's going to be my goal. And I looked at other a few other jobs kind of as backups because it's really hard to be a firefighter. It's They don't always have openings, yeah. especially in the Air Force. They, they, they go really fast. So I'm like, oh, I have a couple of backup ones. And I saw EOD and I was like, well, this one looks really interesting too. I mean, this will be my this will be my backup to it. And it just took me in a whole different you know path in life. So after everything kind of happened with my injury and recovery. And it took a long time because now we're in Washington state and it took us a long time to get here. This is where we wanted to settle. And then it took like two years to finally find where we wanted to be. And when we moved to Washington, it took a couple of years to finally find exactly where we're going to settle here. We moved again and then now we're settled. So I'm like, you know, now's the time. If I'm going to make something happen, I got to do it now. And uh, my wife's like, well, why don't you give the fire department a call? Because they have a volunteer side of it. See what, see what you can do with them. Mm -hmm. like, you know what? Yeah, that's right. I'm At the time, I just turned 38. So like I'm 37 years old. I'm not going to get any younger. And I know how much more my body can take. You know, might as well use it while I, while I still can. And I went down to talk to the the captain down there. And he's like, I don't know what you can do here. I, I know you're motivated. looks like you, you really want to do this. It's all going to depend on what the doctors say when they do the physical. I went and talked to the doctors, did the physical there. They're like, hey, whatever you can accomplish, all right, cool. Give it a shot. See what you can do. And the funny thing was like the whole thing was just to go work with the fire department here, help them out. They have things called water tenders. They're the big water trucks. Mm-hmm. And, the, and we live a little rural out in the area we're at. So they need people out here that can help drive these things. I'm like, you know what? I'll be happy if I can just do that. You know, I'll get to wear a uniform. I'll get the help of the fire department. And so I'm doing that with them. And they're like, hey, Dan, how far do you want to go? I was like, I'll go as far as you guys let me go. And they're like, well, you know what? It takes about a year. You have to have EMT school. You have to be with us about a year. And then if the opening comes up, we'll send you to a fire academy. And I was like, all right, cool. I'll, I'll try and shoot for that. And, uh, it couldn't have been even a month. I think it's maybe a month later. Like, uh, we got some openings for a fire kind of come up. Anyone to do it? And I'm like, well, I would, but I, you know, I don't have EMT stuff. It's like, so what? Sign up and uh, you know, apply and see if you can do it. And I passed the interview and all the physicals and everything. I'm like, all right, you're going to the fire academy. So it went from uh, let's just see what I can do with the fire department. The next thing you know, I'm at the fire academy. Every step was just like, okay, how much further can I push? Yeah. 
And then another door would open. I'm like, should I do it? You know what? Let's see what happens. Why not? It doesn't hurt to try. Yeah, exactly. You know, and it's not like I can do everything great. I mean, I can get everything done with what we had to do in the academy. I just, like I said, you just find a way to do it the best way you can do it. And I've been able to find a way to do pretty much everything except for fit through a 16 inch hole. Like you're supposed to be able to sh- like a simulated like self rescue where you got to get through a hole. Mm-hmm. I'm physically too big. My shoulders are too big to fit through it. Yeah. That's the only thing I was not able to accomplish um, in the academy. Everything else I've been able to do. But that has nothing to do with your injury. That's just you. <laughs> yeah. Well, and are there are limitations? Like it, I finally fixed it. I think one of the funny things is like doing search and rescue. You're supposed to crawl. Yeah. You know, you do a lot of crawling like you're crawling under the smoke. And uh, because one leg I have is is it's got a uh, suspension set up. So it's like got a sleeve that holds on kind of like uh, suction uh-huh. is how it holds on your, your leg. So you'd be crawling and as you're crawling and I, I sweat a lot, unfortunately, but uh, it kind of builds up some moisture in there and it kind of lets it slide. So like the leg is starting to slide off as I'm crawling on the ground. And then the guy behind me is like tapping your leg to let you know, like, Hey, I'm right behind you. And if they tap on top, they grab the leg. And so they pull my leg off. <laughs> So actually in one train op, like as I'm trying to come out, like my leg got caught on something and it pulled my leg right off. So then I found out, okay, we got a pin lock system. And now the, the leg is actually locked pretty much securely with a pin to my leg with, a, with the kind of setup it has. And the, so it's not going to be pulled off. So you just find different ways to make it work. And with me, I got options as far as legs and braces and boots and all stuff. So you just find what combination works and now it, it all works really well. So you've done everything to pass the fire academy, but is there anything that you're kind of worried about, like when you're actually out there fighting a fire, that would be a limitation for you that you know might impact safety or something, or just kind of anything that you're a little bit concerned about going forward with it? Not really worried as much as safety. I know that there's things I still need more work on to make it where I can work it better. But like without having the ankles like I have, doing rooftop operations, depending on the pitch of the roof, is very difficult. I have ways of making it work, but and that's why I just need a little bit more practice at yeah. it. And then they, they do a thing called a, a leg lock on the ladder where you you know wrap your leg through the rung on the ladder and then wrap your ankle around the security so you can like work and do stuff with uh, without having your hands attached to the ladder but still be secure. Yep. I can't actually lock my leg, so I use a ladder belt. If I because now that I actually have boots that work, because the problem I have too is my my brace makes it really hard to find boots. So like I wear a size thirteen normally and the boots were really hard to find ones that fit so they're actually size 15s i had to use which made it walk around like a clown which is really hard to do so it's really hard to fit them through the rungs of the ladder while i now have shoes that fit better so it might make it a little bit easier so there's nothing i'd say would make it a danger for me to do anything it's just more practice i need to make things kind of fine-tune it and refine what the way i do it it's never been like a hey we're going to set you up that you know and kind of make things easier for you the whole time has been we'll let you do whatever you can do yourself. Yeah. You know, we're going to give you the opportunity to accomplish this. If you can do it, then great. It's kind of like they're letting me prove to them by me actually accomplishing. Yeah. So that's really been amazing. I never wanted it. Like if I can't do it, I don't want to do it. Like that's not how I am. I don't want to be given, Hey, here's a job because you're a cripple. You know, right. I want to be able to, to do it because I want to be a firefighter. You know, that's the whole thing. I don't want to be a firefighter with an asterisk next to my name. Sure. You know, I want to be able to do the job. And if for some reason I can't do it, then at least I, I appreciate the, the chance to do it. And if I didn't think I could do it, I would honestly, I would back out. I don't feel there's nothing I can't do right now. And I just really appreciate them giving me the chance to prove that. So what is the next step? You're going to be taking the EMT class in February. Are you now on the department? It's still a volunteer department or is it a full-time staff department? How do they work it there? It's a career department, but they have volunteers too. So the way it works is, you know, they have their volunteer firefighters and they have their career firefighters and then the volunteers will help them out, you know, volunteer time to come in and work with them and do that kind of stuff as firefighters or EMTs. Cause I will be a firefighter EMT soon. So you can help on either way that right now is how that's working. Um, so I'll be a volunteer firefighter with them and helping out as much as I can when I can. And if they need any help with other things, I can, I can come on board. The next step after that, you know, I got a few other certifications I'm going to try and do like EMT firefighter too, but hopefully I can kind of turn around to be a career and apply to do a career position in the future. That's awesome. It's a really great job. It's a great job, like especially after you've done the military and you want that kind of brotherhood feel and you want a little bit of, and you want the excitement. I think being a first responder fits very much in with that. There's a reason that so many veterans go into the fire service after military service. Oh yeah. Like being around the guys and they, they all talk again, most of them are veterans or a lot of them are, but it's just like being in the military again, the way they talk with each other, the way they joke with each other. It's, it's got the, the same kind of feel as it did in the military. Yeah. 
So I'm a nurse practitioner. I have not been injured. You being on the other side of it, what would you tell the medical providers that that treated you or that would be treating someone that's in your position? Like, what would be a really good thing for us to know if we're going to treat somebody? Like, what's a big thing that people missed or that they did really well that was really beneficial to you that we can help other people with? Well, that's interesting because I actually got to do this exact that exact thing. Oh, really? That's cool. Yeah. When I was at Fort Sam, they actually had a, uh, they invited me to come in and do a Skype with the doctors and nurses at Kandahar. So they weren't the exact guys that worked on me, but they're the same yeah. same crew that was doing the same job the guys that worked on me did. And they were asking, like, one of the, the biggest questions I guess a lot of the medical guys were having was, you know, a guy comes in and his injuries are so severe. It's like, he shouldn't be alive, but we're able to save him. But is his quality of life going to be okay? Is it, is it worth saving some, you know, if they have these kind of injuries, are they going to have a good quality enough life to where it's like, let's keep them alive. Right. And you know, it's pretty bad that it's it's gotten to the point where, you know, you have to think like that. But medical technology gotten so well, you can save people that should never be, they should not be alive. And they're able to bring them back. We talk about that all the time when it comes to ICUs and critical care. Yeah. Yeah. So I was able to talk to them about that. It's like, you know, I wasn't like, I hope I wasn't one of those, those same ones that you guys are thinking of that wasn't worth saving. But, you know, my thing is like, if you can do it, do it and then let them let them see, you know, what they can do with their lives. You know, because there's guys out there like missing, you know, three, four limbs and they're doing great things with their life. You know, there's guys with burns from like huge portions of their bodies that are doing amazing things with their life that they should never be alive right now. And looking at them when they're in that condition of freshly injured, they look like they're, there's no chance at life for them. Just give them that shot, you know. You guys are doing your job. You're doing a great job at it. Don't worry. Don't think of it like that because put the ball back in our court to let us do the best we can with our life. And you and they're doing a great job at that. I mean, they're saving people like every day that are that shouldn't have been here. And I know like even with my injuries, it, they don't seem as bad, but they were pretty, pretty bad. If this is like, say, Vietnam, I'd be dead right now because the technology's changed just so much since then. I mean, even probably Desert Storm or even in the beginning of the war, yeah. I'd be dead right now. And I for sure would not be walking around. Even if I did, I'd be definitely a double amputee. I would not have my right leg and I would not be doing the stuff I'm doing. So, you know, talking to the medics, it's just, it's a, it's a hard job with what they're doing and they're doing a great job at it. When you're working on guys like us and you're around that kind of stuff, just think of it like that. We don't think of like what you would want in that situation, because if you're looking at, you're seeing how bad it looks, but you're not really thinking of like the later end game on what they can do. You're looking at them like, if I was like this, I would not want to live, but if you're in that situation, I'm pretty sure you'd look up the guy and like, just help me live, you know, give me a chance if that makes sense. Yeah, of course. I don't know if I it's- rambled on on that one, but <laughs> hopefully I got the point on that one. That was great. It's so hard for us on our side. We try and look at the bigger picture, but you see something so horrific in that moment and you then watch all the bad examples. You watch the people that are kept alive for too long, especially like, you know, the elderly that should have died more naturally. Obviously, that's not your case, but you see the people that are where things go wrong because they're the ones that stay in the hospital. We don't see the people that do well because they do well and they leave. Mm -hmm. So it's really great for us to get a different perspective of people that are helped and move on to have happy lives and what a happy life looks like, even though that's not the life they had beforehand. Yeah, exactly. So is there anything else about your story that we kind of didn't touch on? Hmm, I'm trying to think. We we got a, a, a lot of it, a lot of it down. And I know Pete got quite a bit of down. And that's the, one of the great things with getting connected with Pete again through Brian and hearing his podcast is it helped fill in a lot of the gaps in the story of what happened during my injury. Like I didn't know about the issue of the helicopter. And if it wasn't for Brian, I would never have been able to talk to Pete and find out later on about the whole bleeding issue, like how he actually was able to stop the bleeding, but it uh, was just the residual ooze or whatever coming out. Mm-hmm. So having the opportunity to, to talk to Pete and hear from Pete and, and hear him talk with you, it's been actually really therapeutic for myself because it helped me figure out other things that were going on that I didn't even know were going on. Like listen to the podcast he did with you the other day, and he mentioned about how there's gunfire after my IED exploded. Mm-hmm. I didn't even know about that. I honestly never even heard that until I heard the podcast. So it's it's really kind of interesting to be able to kind of go back into that story and then kind of fill it back in because there's other, there's other things that happened during that is really good to see if that's actually something that happened or not. Like I remember when they're loaded me from the hole to the bird, the helicopter, I remember asking my buddy if, uh, is my leg gone? 
And he's like, oh yeah, it's still there. And I look down and my memory tells me, I looked down and saw my foot in a plastic bag, like facing and thinking that there's no way that's going to, yeah, I lost that leg. It's gone. Mm-hmm. But then I don't know if that's an actual memory that happened. You know, is that something like was made up in my head? Um, so it's having the ability to to do this and, and talk to people and especially ones that were there like Pete. It's been really great for me. And I, I enjoy doing that kind of stuff. Well, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast and talking to me about this and just kind of sharing your side of the story. It's it's always wonderful to get a different perspective for us. I mean, even though obviously you were not my patient, but to get your view and, and to see medicine from a different world. Because I mean, obviously sick people are why we do this. So it's wonderful to get that view. Oh, no. So thank you so much. No, I appreciate having me. It's uh, it's great to be able to talk and tell my story and especially to the kind of people that work on people like me during that that bad time. It really helps to build a, a bigger picture of the situation, not just for myself, but what other people are going through. And I appreciate that opportunity. Well, is there any organization or anything that you want to plug that was like helpful for you in your recovery? Any Anything that you want me to, to plug? Uh, there's actually multiple ones on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. So uh, the first one that was there was uh, the EOD Warrior Foundation. Being an Air Force EOD, they were right there for me. If I ever needed anything, I just asked them and they would make sure they'd get me whatever I needed. Just amazing, amazing organization. The Semper Five Fund and America's Fund was, if I needed anything as well, they would help me out. Like, for instance, I need, when I got my home, I need a riding lawnmower. I called them up. They're like, hey, the problem, we got your riding lawnmower. That kind of stuff. That's awesome. So Semper Fi Ameris Fund are just amazing organizations. And they, they call me now and then too to check up on me and say how I'm, how I'm doing. And, and so does the EOD Warrior Foundation. And then a really, really big one is Homes for Our Troops. Homes for Our Troops built me an adapted home out here in Bremerton, Washington. That is 100% mortgage free and it's completely barrier free. So you know, if I have to use my wheelchair to get around in my house, there's no problems with it. The bathroom is completely set up to where I can do anything I need to, even if I'm in my wheelchair easily. Kitchen is set up the same way, lower counters and uh, pull down things out of the, the cabinet so you can reach them if you're in your wheelchair. I stay out of my wheelchair as much as possible, mm-hmm. but I know as I'm getting older and I'm continuing to beat the hell out of myself that my body's yeah. going to be putting me back in a wheelchair eventually. And I live in a home that I can grow into. It, I'll never outgrow it. I, it'll always have the abilities for me to do. So Homes for Our Troops was amazing. That's amazing. For that. And I know there's going to be a few others as well. I know I'm going to f- forget a few of them right now, but there, there's been a few others. There's, there's been some not so good ones, but there's some. those are some of the amazing ones out there. So Dan, before you go, you had mentioned that you are going to be doing the LLS stair climb in Seattle and you're raising some money for it. I couldn't climb all those stairs and I've never been injured. So tell me what you're doing. Well, the first challenge for me was uh, actually trying to become a firefighter. And when I was going through the academy, I was like, you know what? I need to, need to set another bar for me to do. And I yeah. I hate stairs. I even hate them when I had two legs. <laughs> so I saw this was coming up. It's the uh, LLS firefighter stair climb. And what the whole thing is, is it's uh, 2,000 firefighters from around the country, some from around the world, are going to go to the Columbia Center in Seattle. And they're going to climb, or we're going to climb, and I'm going to climb 69 floors. The Columbia Center is actually, the, I think it's the second tallest building west of the Mississippi. So my one-legged self, barely one-legged <laughs> self, is going to climb in full bunker gear um, with SCBA, which is the the air pack on, while on air. So with a mask on, on canned air on your back, climbing 69 yeah. floors. And all the money is going to go towards the leukemia, mm-hmm. leukemia and uh, FOMA Society. And I have a page that is uh, set up for my fundraiser right now on the LLSWA.org page. So I can I can send you a link to that and hopefully you guys can help with my fundraiser and I will hopefully be posting stuff as uh, I progress to getting towards that stage and afterwards and let everyone know how that went. All right. So I know there's firefighters, there's EMTs, there's nurses that are listening to this. We all hate leukemia and lymphoma. Dan, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Guys, go on over to his page and donate. I'm going to be posting the links and then I will be posting updates as you are doing the stair climb and hopefully we will help reach your fundraising goals. How much do you have to fundraise? I've reached the minimum right now, but I set a goal of 1800 and I'm sitting at about 510 right now. So still got a way to go to that initial goal that I have and uh, hoping I can get as close as possible to it. All right. Well, I'm definitely going to donate. So if everyone else can donate too, we can get you to that 1800 goal. Everyone look on our Facebook page, which is Facebook slash Antidotes Podcast. Look on our Instagram, Antidotes Podcast, or on Twitter, Antidotes Pod. 
My Twitter is Christine the NP, or you can send me an email at antidotespodcast at gmail.com. Connect with us on social media. I'll post any of those links to his donation page. You'll see me. I'll donate and subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on iTunes so we can know if you're enjoying it or not. And I hope you guys enjoyed this week's show. Thank you so much, Dan, for taking all this time on a Sunday to talk to me. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it.